Welcome everyone to the Corin True Center for Baha'i History. The center was established by the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States in January of 2024. Its purpose is to foster the study of Baha'i history, Baha'i sacred texts, both in translation and in commentary, Baha'i philosophical and theological concepts, and world religions from a Baha'i and comparative perspective. I'm Dr. Robert Stockman, director of the center. Joining me today is Dr. Omid Bahamabami, associate professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at Binghamton University, the State University of New York. His research interests includes themes and topics in Islamic intellectual history and the history and literature of the Babi and Baha'i religions. He obtained his PhD in Middle Eastern and Islamic studies in 2013 from the University of Toronto, where Todd Lawson was his advisor. He will join me in our conversation today with Todd, a dear colleague and friend to both of us. Dr. Todd Lawson is a professor emeritus of Islamic thought at the University of Toronto. He has been a Baha'i since 1968 and has been a member of the Association for Baha'i Studies since 1975. The ABS awarded him a Distinguished Book Award for his study of the Qayyum al -Asma, which was titled Gnostic Apocalypse in Islam, published by Rutledge in 2012. Todd has published numerous articles and books on the relationship between the Baha'i faith and Islam. Also on Koran, Koran, Koran commentary, Sufism and Shiism. He edited a special edition of the Journal of Religious Studies about the Baha'i Faith in 2012. This was probably the first time a premier academic English language journal dedicated an entire issue to the Baha'i Faith. He lives in Montreal with his wife, daughter, and grandchildren. And if you want to know more about him, go to toddlawson.ca, where you can find his CV and a list of publications. So that's my lengthy introduction, everybody. And so we can actually get started. I have the first question. We have a whole bunch of questions. Omid and I are going to alternate asking him. And he is free to riff as he goes uh, on these questions. So I guess the first question, Todd, is what inspired your decision to study Islam in graduate school? All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to be here. Can Thank you. You can hear me. Yep. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, what inspired me to study Islam was being a good American, born in 1948. Uh, I, until I encountered the Baha'i faith, really, I knew nothing about Islam. I had no knowledge of Islam. I don't think the word was used in any school that I attended. Uh, high school, college, certainly not at all. Muhammad was not mentioned. Uh, Islam as a, uh, an element of world culture and civilization and history was never acknowledged not even negatively. <laughs> so there was this massive silence. So when I encountered the Baha'i faith and uh, read one of the first important book for me was the Seven Valleys. And I encountered all of these references to Muhammad and Ali and Rumi and Hadith and the Quran and so forth. I became sort of uh, uh, very deeply interested in this. What's what's up? <laughs> and so I, I had become familiar with the Baha'i notion of progressive revelation, and the references to Islam in in the writings, particularly the Seven Valleys, were very uh, enticing for me. I wanted to know more about it, and there there was that, and there was that response and coupled with the general insistence by the Baha'is whom I was associating with at the time in Toronto, 
because I had left the United States to avoid going to the war in, uh, in 1968, January. I, w I was uh, not interested in going to, to Vietnam. So I, I left and went to Canada and immediately ran into Baha'is. Uh, what struck me was a kind of a cognitive dissonance there were all these references to Islam and the prophet in glowing terms in the writings of Baha'u'llah, and then yet an insistence on post Abdul Baha writings <laughs> that the Baha'i faith is really not Islamic. It's not an Islamic uh, sect, it is its own religion, it is a new religion. And in the process of stressing the new religion aspect of the Baha'i faith, Islam, I thought, was given rather interesting position in all of this, which struck me as providing room for further exploration. So I, but even then, I, I couldn't have formulated all this as clear and lucid as it must sound to you now. I couldn't have formulated all that all this then, but all these things were roiling around inside me. And when I finally went back to university, because I had left university in the States to go to Canada, I went back to university about four years later at UBC after having pioneered to the Yukon for a couple of years, where it gets to be 80 below zero, by the way, uh, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, went back to school to be to try and get some kind of profession. Uh, I was looking through the the course list and saw this course called the Heritage of Islam, and I thought, well, this might uh, help me think about these things. I was very interested. I hadn't read any really anything on Islam except. Frank Herbert's book, Dune, <laughs> is, of course, is a kind of a disguised discussion of Islam uh, and, and was actually very inspired by that book as well. Uh, but so I took this course and was fortunate to have a really magnificent teacher uh, whose name is Hannah Cassis, uh, who I think is still with us all. Uh, uh, he produced that massive concordance to the Arbery Quran, for example. He himself was an archaeologist. He's a Palestinian Christian. But in his class on the heritage of Islam, uh, when he spoke about the Quran, the air would change color. Yeah. It was just astonishing. And I thought, I want to know what's going on here. I want to, because I knew that as a Baha'i, I knew that we were very attached to the notion of the word and so on and so forth. And I saw a direct relationship uh, to this veneration of the word, but the word assumed uh, really magnificent proportions in these kinds of classes. And then I, I decided that I decided I was not, I changed my mind, uh, no more preparation for law school. I wanted to study Arabic and uh, I wanted to uh, continue. So I did, and I went, applied to graduate school to McGill, where, uh, where I carried on uh, studying the Quran. And then finally, I did my PhD there on the Bob's writings and the Bob's uh, writings about the Quran. So. We will come to the, the PhD dissertation and the writings of the Bob shortly. Uh, before that, though, when you initially moved to the Institute for Islamic Studies at McGill University, you completed your master's thesis on a very significant and rather contentious, to say it lightly, perhaps, topic about which very little perhaps was known at the time, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus in the Quran. Yeah. which was later, of course, subsequently published uh, as The Crucifixion and the Qur'an by One World Academic. Right. It's a book, of course, that's been very well received by prominent scholars of the Qur'an and of Christian and Islamic relations. 
and is today the definitive study of the of the topic and an indispensable and required reading for anyone who wishes to study the figure of Jesus in the Quran generally. Uh, I'm curious if you can please speak about what led you to choose this as a topic for your MA thesis and uh, how it was that the project initially unfolded and how perhaps it was received by your uh, thesis advisor at the time. Well, thanks, Omid. Very kind and generous words. May God forgive you. I don't know if it's uh, all that great, but it's, it, it did establish one or two things about the crucifixion crucifixion in the Islamic context and the way it's understood in the Quran that had had to be taken more seriously because of the argument. There, there are many oversights and it needs to be brought up to date and done better and so forth, but it's still a very interesting topic. And I think that... Uh, I, I think that I was prepared for this interest in, in this problem from having studied the writings of the faith, which insist upon a spiritual meaning for the words, or a, if you like, a metaphorical meaning for, for words, that religious language is full of figuration. And... Uh, uh, I was struck, on the one hand, by the insistence in some Islamic texts, or many <laughs> Islamic texts, that Jesus was not crucified over and against what I knew to be a f fact of history as permanent as the law of gravity, that Jesus indeed was crucified. And so these two things struck me as and yeah, here's something that we can think about and what's up. So that's what that's what started it. And uh, I wrote a paper with Wadiya Haddad at, at McGill University on uh, on the crucifixion in a theology seminar. And he said, well, you ought to do an MA on this. So I was happy to have some kind of encouragement. It doesn't always happen. And so I, I went with it, and he unfortunately left McGill, and I and finished it with Charles Adams, uh, and then published it with a few additions and emendations and corrections and so forth with One World. You know, that's that's how it happened. But it was the idea that you know the the the, the Quran verse on which this denial of the crucifixion crucifixion is is fixed or anchored is my reading and the reading of many other people is, uh, is an example of this uh, figuration that the Quran uses in order to make a point, <laughs> to make a point much more uh, powerfully than it would be by just simple syllogistic reasoning. Uh, and uh, the insistence upon the early Islamic tradition that it, it means that there was no historical crucifixion of Jesus, I still very interesting and puzzling and all the rest of it, but I discovered that one of the first people to say that the Quran denied the crucifixion was not a Muslim at all, but John of Damascus. Uh, and it struck me that this would have suited John of Damascus's agenda much more <laughs> uh, um, but much better than than necessarily was for the Islamic group, the Muslims of the first two or three centuries. Salvation is a part of the Quran, but it's not really a, ma a massive, massive problem. Uh, it's more about behaving yourself, obeying the laws, uh, treating each other well, being kind and and you know, and all of these things. Salvation is a particularly important Christian deal. Uh, numerous articles are available demonstrating this. So it was clear to me that John of Damascus was warning his flock to stay away from these these 
even though he was working for them at the time, he was working in the in the Diwan. Uh, he he still wrote to his flock and preached to them, and this was this is where it began. And since Muslims venerate scholarship, no matter where it is, uh, science and intellectual activity, the salvation is. I'm, I'm going to be somewhat you know, casual about this was we have to move on, you know, salvation not being such a huge deal. This, this great alim in Jerusalem or Damascus, who says that this is what the book, well, you know, he's probably right. He's, he's a great leader of the, he was a, what the last church fought, in fact. So we'll, we'll take a, a, an arrow from his quiver. And since, and it helps establish Islamic identity very early on. So the, these are the factors involved. But now we also find many places, especially in poetry, in Islamic poetry, Iranian and Persian poetry, mystical poetry, in the Baha'i writings, uh, you know, and, and in the Brethren of Purity and places like this, where the crucifixion is taken as a, as a historical reality. You know, one of the great contributions of the of the of the dissertation and eventually the book is to make accessible and available so much of the uh, the rich exegetical tradition uh, in Quranic studies about this text. Mm -hmm. I remember I recall reading the the dissertation as a graduate student because it wasn't a book yet at that mm -hmm. time, and I it was the first time I encountered the word eisegesis. Mm -hmm. I I'd, I'd read the word exegesis many times, but had never seen or encountered the word eisegesis and how it is that you employed it and discussed it in the context of uh, interpretation and commentaries about this verse. Well, after the completion of the the master's thesis, uh, you of course turn to uh, the study of the writings of the Bab more intensely. The study of his writings generally, uh, but then it was the early Quran commentaries and specifically the, the Qayyim al-Asma, a celebrated commentary of the Bab on the Quran's Surah of Joseph yes. that specifically garnered your, your attention and your intellectual interest. And you ultimately completed in 1987 the first, I believe it's the first PhD dissertation on a major work of Baha'i scripture to have been completed in English. I mean, I could be wrong, but I believe it's the first dissertation of its kind. There are, of course, other dissertations that preceded it about the history and development and uh, literature of the Babi and Baha'i religions generally, but it was the first dissertation of its kind that's dedicated entirely to uh, a seminal Baha'i text. Uh, can you please discuss you know, what it was that led you to choose this topic uh, uh, for the for the PhD dissertation? I, we're, we're curious to know how it was received by your PhD advisor at the time, Professor Landall, who himself is a, a major figure, of course, in the many of the fields that you've mentioned, Sufism, Islamic yeah. intellectual history more broadly. And also if you can speak to what some of the challenges were that you encountered in the process of uh, both proposing the topic and uh, completing the research that was required. Uh, and uh, maybe in your answer, you could also address yeah. what some of the significant themes or contributions that you found in the Bob's writings and the Qayyum al -Asma or the or on commentaries of the Bob more generally that continue to resonate today. All right. Well, thanks, Omid. I'll, I'm happy to speak about all the things you mentioned. If I forget some of them, remind me. We're going to begin on what I suppose in the context of this uh, story is uh, uh, might function as kind of a day of the covenant. <laughs> um, before I was went back to university when I was living in Vancouver about 1970, 1971. Uh, there were virtually no Persians at all anywhere in the, in the Baha'i community. It was sort of, uh, you know, an occasion when a Persian appeared, you know, here, here we have, you know, and I was, uh, I was working as a printer actually. And I uh, uh, went to the feast and uh, there happened to be a Persian there. And so I was, I ended up sitting next to him, and uh, somebody had mentioned the Bob's writings in the feast, and uh, uh, had mentioned how 
difficult and problematic they were. And I was sitting next to this person and uh, I said, I said, well, what is it about them that it is so problematic and difficult? He was not a scholar. He, I don't know. I think he was, you know, might have been a florist. I don't know what he did. But he was, you know, he was very nice. And oh, I, I remember he looked at my hands and it had it still had ink on my hands. And he's, oh, I see you, you work, he said. <laughs> I just couldn't get the ink out of my, he was like he was relieved because I, I suppose he thought I was just a hippie, you know. <laughs> he's, oh, he was, he was, he, so I said, so what is up with this uh, difficulty of the Bible? He says, oh, well, really, you, you mustn't even think about this question because you will never be able to understand the writings of the Bible. I, I thought, okay. <laughs> and that's all it was. Then about four, five, six, seven, eight years later, I was at, found myself at McGill. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, the myomalasma is challenging. But I, I decided that I wanted to Pay attention to it. Why? Because the same thing. Uh, reading, I mean, I had already started sort of studying Baha'i literature formally and and uh, professionally, if you like, and reading articles by the first generation of Europeans who wrote about the Bob's writings. Uh, and looking at some of those early editions of the Arabic by von Rosen and the, the and Brown and people like that, and then you know reading Brown, who was usually very very sympathetic to everything, as you know, E.G. Brown was, I don't know where, where, what the world would be like today if there had been no E.G. Brown, for example, as far as the Baha'i uh, faith is concerned in the Baha'i community. He has, uh, uh, you know, future generations will discover his significance for for the Baha'i world. But in any case, one of the things he said was uh, talking about the, about precisely the tafsir on the Surah of Joseph, the Ayum al Asma. He said, "Here it is. It's very difficult to follow. We don't always know how it's proceeding, what's up, what's down." And in places, frankly, it's an unintelligible rhapsody. Again, I said, ah. <laughs> because there's a basic law of discourse, right? That if it's said, the understanding is assumed. So I, I felt this was a slip of, uh, of Brown. I thought, I thought that, you know, he, but it inspired me to actually look more deeply at the at this work, which is really, frankly, I mean, yeah, it is. It is different. It's it, it's for people who are used to listening, for example, to uh, how high the moon. And they hear Charlie Parker playing, you know, ornithology. They're not going to immediately see the connection. But this genius, the Bob, who is, was, and always will be an incredible genius, a mind larger than the universe, rearranged the entire Quran in a kind of improvisational artistic gesture in which everything there is no there is no problem with meaning here what we need to do though is educate ourselves and try to acquire the same kind of interior that his first audience had which he had and recognize that that this is this is um a virtuoso performance of uh, a, a musical, if you like, uh, 
a music of pure thought, as in the phrase of Gershom Sholem, a music of per, pure thought, which, yes, takes liberties with the text. He broke all the rules. This is why we recognize him as a manifestation. He broke the rules. <laughs> but he, he did not relegate the notion of meaning to... Uh, uh, to non non-existent or m meaning is just as important as music in this thing. And so that, but it was extremely exciting. I mean, the first thing that you have to do, of course, is to read the Quran backwards and forwards and upside down, because indeed, if you look at the Qayyum al-Asma, I don't know what the final percentage would be, but I would say it's at least 80% is Quran. But it's what he does with it. It's like the musical notes are these Quranic phrases and messages. It's, a, it's as if the Quran is a piano that, 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 with 6,000 keys, right? And the Bab plays it. The way he feels it. And it meaning may not be the single most important thing in this performance, meaning in the way normal it's normally construed, but it is in fact very important and it's never absent. It is he's demonstrating his his authority and power over the text, but his more than that, even his really deep love. He could not have done this without having the whole thing at his fingertips. I mean, it's astonishing. So that's, and my, my advisor was Herman Landold, Allah Zikrahi Salam, was uh, very much in favor. Of, there was no, no, let's, let's do it. Why not? I said, what do you think about this? He said, why not? <laughs> A rare soul, really, yeah, yeah. Because the study of the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i writings, especially in an Islamic institute, has been shrouded with all kinds of, you know, barriers and, uh, and uh, you know, criticisms and uh, hesitancies and so on for all kinds of reasons. But he was, he was, had no problem at all with it. In fact, he was very encouraging. So I was lucky. And we've all been lucky. It, the dissertation, of course, had a life, and then it had has had an afterlife. Yeah. It was uh, subsequently uh, published in, in revised form, of course, in 2012 under the title Gnostic Apocalypse yeah. and Islam, the Literary Beginnings or Origins of the Babi Religion. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And now, shall we move on to talk about the Quran, Todd? Because um, you've spent so much of your, your career really studying the Quran. Yeah. How has your understanding of the Quran and its place in the education of humanity evolved? Oh. And, you, and I should add, before you do that, that we're now, we are now broadcasting live on YouTube. There was some sort of technical problem between StreamYard and YouTube, and that's been re resolved. I guess StreamYard resolved it. So we are now on Facebook and we're on YouTube. Okay. All right. Well, hello everyone. Um, the place of the Quran and human human education. I mean, it's it's hard to know where to begin, Rob. There's probably the single most important book that has ever occurred in the sublunar realm. Uh, it is a uh, uh, <laughs> its influence is powerful, strong, ongoing, and eternal. It, um, it is a remarkable, to use the word text, seems much too weak. It is uh, because it, it's not only, again, meaning, but it's also full of petitions to the interior of human beings in a way that transcends meaning. It's, if you like, a mystical discourse. There's no book that's been more influential. This is, I think, probably tabulatable. <laughs> um, 
it's it's essential that uh, the world become uh, educated about it and learn it and study it. Uh, a for Taiori, the Baha'i community. Uh, it should be it should be uh, on the top of the list. I mean, one of the reasons people thought that Qayyum al-Asma was meaningless or uh, a me uh, what uh, something or another rhapsody. What did Brown call it? Uh, not a mean, uh, uh, unintelligible rhapsody. Is because they didn't know the Quran. <laughs> if you know the Quran, you instantly see what's going on. Mujan Moman years ago wrote a very important article in which he demonstrated this about the trial of Mullah Ali Bastami, in which uh, you know there was not lost on the gathering of Shi'i and Sunni judges who were who were trying him for blasphemy, I guess, that this book was all about the Quran <laughs> and that it was dependent upon the Quran and it 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 presumed it to rewrite the Quran and re-reveal the Quran in a different key and so on. So and it, it's uh, yeah so no there's no end to what can be said about <laughs> if all the seas were ink they there wouldn't be enough to talk about how great the Quran is, let alone uh, to record the revelation and the words of God. I didn't, you know, this is a big topic. It's a beautiful topic. I thank you for asking it, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a great disservice to humanity that that uh, we do not take it as seriously as it should be taken. <laughs> Whether it's in the, you know, just the community, the like the outside world, if you like, the non-Baha'i world, you know, the life of Muhammad should be taught from grade school in, in, in the Western world. And the Quran should also be taught from grade school. And yes, it's difficult. It's not, uh, it doesn't conform to our normal idea of a book. There's no beginning, middle, and end, right? But this should be liberating rather than constraining. Because when you, because so many of the great minds of history and the present have found inspiration, there must be something else going on besides the lack of a beginning, a middle, and an end. There must be some something happening here that is important for human beings to be in touch with. Fantastic! And to what extent has looking at the Quran through the lens of the Baha'i writings shaped your understanding of the, of the text? Well, I think that's also a very interesting question. And I think that my confidence that uh, religious language and scripture had multiple meanings, which I encountered first from the Baha'i writings, uh, had a big effect, but but here is where you know what was it? Augustine said you know finding the truth is like having trying to scratch an itch with the same finger that has the itch. You know, you don't know where one thing begins and the other thing ends. It's a bit like that with the Baha'i writings because this this uh, idea of multiple levels of truth. Is Kaley is la me? Yeah, you know this is the, the this is one of the great gifts that the Islamic intellectual tradition gave to the world. That things don't mean just one thing. <laughs> that that scripture doesn't. I mean, there has been poetry before Islam, but what happened in the case of Islam? It was somewhat institutionalized in a in a way that hadn't happened before that everything has an external meaning and an internal meaning, and then on and on and on. This, this was a get, an Islamic gift that was given to me by Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah also introduced me to Muhammad. So these are, and when 
when someone such as Baha'u'llah introduces someone to you, take them very seriously, right? Uh, so uh, it's a, it's, it's, there's a great deal of mutuality involved here. Yes, uh, your, your scholarship, uh, you know, has not only helped elucidate the Quran and uh, the writings of the Bab and and Baha'u'llah, but it's also helped to clarify so much about the intellectual context in which the Babi religion appeared. Mm -hmm. um, you speak at great lengths in your in your work, both written and spoken about the fact that the Babi religion emerged, you know, not within a vacuum, but within the matrix of 12 or Shi Islam in Iran in the 19th century, a time of great expectation and chaos and confusion, perhaps not unlike that which existed in Arabia during the early days of Islam. Can you please, uh, you, you've spoken rather beautifully about the artistic uh, contributions of, of the Bab and of the Qayyim al yes. uh, the way it has changed or altered both spirit and form in our understanding. Can you just add more about how it is that the Bab's teachings, uh, present in his writings, present in his life, uh, both built upon and challenged some of the existing Islamic norms and ideas at the time? Well, the, the 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 major thing in my understanding of of the context, and you know, the Baha'is are are commanded, if you like, not if you like, they are commanded to study the historical context by the guardian of the rise and development of the Baha'i, the Babi, and the Baha'i faith, and also to study the context for clues as to how to understand the, the station claimed by both the Bab and Baha'u'llah. This is, a, this is something that has to be welded to historical, cultural scholarship. It's, uh, you, you, you might also be able to draw inspiration from the dream you had about the Bab or Baha'u'llah, but the Guardian wants us to make sure that we study the history, the society, the expectations, the languages that his first audience was a part of. Yeah. And so in that audience, there is a, a, a firm belief that there is really no, human beings are not divided into two things, intellectual and spiritual or emotional and cerebral, that the human being is a, is a unified entity that perceives and expresses. So in fact, even to use the word artist, it sort of draws the attention away from the whole wholeness of human, the human being, as understood, I think, in the time of the Bab. So what he did was to insist through his writings, very and very convincing writings. Uh, both syllogistically, but again, I'm going to use that problematic term artistically. What he did was to insist that there is no stopping to the world, that the world is continuing, that the resurrection day is the other half of a heartbeat to the day of the covenant, that they are constantly in motion, and that this that this is carrying on. Whereas a big part of, shall we say, you know, the curriculum of the, of the, say, the people who began, became ultimately known as the Letters of the Living, concentrated on such dire things as the end of the world, the, you know, 
the, 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 the great battles between good light and darkness, goodness and evil and so on. The, the Bab also was knew about these things, of course, and, and honored them because they, they come from the Quran originally. So if it's in the Quran, you must take it seriously. But it is, uh, there was not this kind of dire hopelessness that, that, that can accompany discussions of the day of resurrection, for example, or the day of judgment. Uh, there was a sense that the Bab is talking about the day of resurrection being now, and yet this is, this is in a completely different key than we might have expected, but his, his virtuosity is convincing. And so we are, we are, we are very happy because this looks to us like as young men and women, young, you know, sort of senior graduate students and assistant professors in the largely attached to the Sheikh here, who are hoping for a future they saw one with the Bob. <laughs> they saw that, you know, this, this, this has possibilities. This is not the end of the world. I, I think that was a big factor. Indeed, a, a, in a recent paper, a heading of yours, uh, so insightful, the end or the end. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas some were expecting the end, here the Vav appears and brings us the end. What is coming? What is coming next? And I recall several years ago you were uh, expatiating upon the significance of this title of the of, of the Bob, and uh, this, of course, was part of uh, your your book, the Gnostic Apocalypse, looking at the the, the designation the Bob and its roots and early. In the Quran, of course, first and foremost, and then later Shi'i sources. And in the context, you were saying that the Bab, the door, every door both opens to from, from one space to another. Yeah. And uh, so we have, a, we have a sense, and you've given us such great appreciation as the space that came before the Bab and the space that in which the Bab himself appears. Yeah. Uh, and we know that the Bab also opens the door to. Uh, the Baha'i revelation and uh, the Baha'i faith. Um, so I would also be love to hear for you to talk a bit about um, the similarities and, and differences, convergences and distinctive qualities or what you call uh, and what others have called continuities and discontinuities uh, between Islam and the Baha'i religion, the Baha'i revelation, the writings and teachings of, of Baha'u'llah that the Bab uh, helped usher in. Uh, well, um, again, we have the finger, you know, scratching the finger with the, with the one that itches, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little sometimes hard to delineate because, of course, the Bab was a Muslim. Baha'u'llah was a Muslim. Abdul Baha was a Muslim. He went to the mosque every Friday of his life when he was in the Holy Land. You know, the and these people, the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, they had the highest possible regard for Islam. When they killed the Bab, they killed a heart that probably loved the Prophet and the Imams more than anybody else on the planet. It's unbelievable the kinds of things that he says about the imams and the prophet and Fatima and, and, uh, and the Quran, the, it was, uh, it was his life. It, it was his heart. These things were his heart. He says that explicitly actually in the oldest datable text that we have, it's just, they, <laughs> that, you know, the, these, these are part of your heart and they are your heart. And uh, this was, what, you know, he was a student of, of Sheikh Ahmad and Sayyid Qasim as well, or an admirer. So it's, however, there is a time that comes when, uh, when there's a, there is a new revelation. Islam classically 
denies the space for a new revelation or a, a new prophet. Notice that neither Baha'u'llah nor the Bab call themselves prophets out of respect for this Islamic uh, axiom uh, and for other reasons as well, no doubt. Uh, but it, instead of doing that, the entire terminology of, 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 of theophany has changed. And, and we use this beautiful word which begins to acquire legs in the writings of Ibn Arabi, the idea of the manifestation. It's taken up again by Sheikh Ahmad and Sayyid Karzam and, and elaborated and theorized and so forth. And this covers the territory so that if even if we think that Muhammad was the seal of the prophets, there is room, according to this way of thinking, for a continuance of revelation through uh, uh, manifestation. Pro pro prophethood may have ceased. There's no more need to prophesy the coming of the promised one. The promised one is now here, is how the algebra works out. Right. So from the strictly, uh, the strict progressive revelation point of view, from the Baha'i point of view, there is no difference. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the perfect, as the Bab said, the, the heaven of Islam is this new revelation. This is, this is what Islam was leading to. Now, of course, you'll run into arguments with people who don't quite see things that way. And so, but, you know, here I am, I tend to, you know, avoid confrontation, being a big coward. And I don't like to, uh, you know, I don't like to draw distinctions where none exist, frankly. You know, I don't like to make it more difficult than it already is. So we have explicit things like the abolition of holy war by Baha'u'llah. Very clear. And you, you can't dispute it. It's there. There's no tat wheel that can be performed on it to make it say, oh, you didn't really do that. It's very, very clear. This is a distinction. This is a distinction. But behold, the categories in which the revelation of the Bab and the revelation of Baha'u'llah are expressed are, again, bestowals from the Islamic world. They're, these categories, which some of them have been stretched, you know, and moved. But when we have things like which we typically see as differences between the Baha'i faith and Islam, for example, like the equality of men and women. There are, there are very powerful Muslim thinkers, both men and women, who suggest that this was, has been in Nuxio in the Quran from the very beginning. And that we have an example here from the Baha'i point of view that now the heaven of Islam has been attained. That it is now being directly uh, taught and established and so on. So I, I like to see it as uh, what? The Baha'i faith has never been anti-Islamic. <laughs> Let's put it another way. Ever. This is a sin against the teachings of Baha'u'llah to think like this. I, forgive me for using such strong language, but it's the truth. Uh, never. Uh, if if you were to take out the quotations from the Hadith and from the Quran, from the Baha'i writings, they would be considerably smaller. I don't know what the actual uh, percentages would be, but they would be smaller. And they would not be nearly as rich as they are now. Right, so we have a great dependence on the Quran and the Hadith and the uh, categories with which Islam is, has been thought, especially in its Shi'i iteration in the close of the 18th century and so on. So there, there's not what the Baha'i faith 
criticizes and what it does not accept is this idea of a clergy with with sort of uh, immense power to control the lives of the followers or the believers. And this is a situation which many of our colleagues and friends, Muslim colleagues and friends say this is an aberration to begin with. It should never have been allowed to develop in Islam. So, so there are all these convergences, which I would much rather concentrate on than differences. But uh, maybe you have some ideas that I'm not thinking of. I, you know, if, if you have, uh, I mean, yes, it's a new community. It's a, it's a where things are very explicit, right? But again, the, the oneness of mankind is there in the Quran. The oneness of religion is there in the Quran. The oneness of God is certainly there in the Quran. And with the Bab, we see that not only that we have these three onenesses, but we have another oneness that is asserted, the oneness of time and history. That there is this, this fourth oneness, if you like, that the door, yes, opens in both directions. And we cannot, uh, we cannot do without it. Uh, I think the most important contribution in, the con in this dialogue between the Baha'i faith, which is a distinct religion now, I don't think there's any question about that, <clears throat> is the, the notion of the manifestation and the, the solidity, if that's a word, of the, of the notion of the covenant. And this is universally agreed upon by people who identify themselves as Baha'is. This is a very unusual thing in religious history. And uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite uh, distinct, you know, in, from coming out of the Islamic uh, uh, period, if you like. But I'm, I'm babbling a little bit because I, I'm not sure I you know what to do here. <laughs> I think it's been really quite useful and, and helpful, actually. And, and I think you, you really underscored the continuity between the faith and Islam extremely well, something that I've become more and more aware of really every year as a Baha'i. Yeah. Um, just the terminology, the concepts. Like you said, there's nothing in the Quran about a clergy. There's mm -hmm. co consultation in the Quran. There's all kinds of things in the Quran that Baha'is would recognize that you might say never had a chance to fully develop for various reasons. Uh, I think of, um, oh, what's his name? <clears throat> the famous American sociologist who did a study of uh, the evolution of religion and said Islam was was born a modern religion, but too soon. <laughs> Maybe, off yeah. by, uh, by time, well, you know, uh, too soon for Europeans, maybe. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, well, well, too soon, too soon for the Muslims to be able to follow through because they created a clergy, among other things. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. See, yeah. I mean, in terms of the way, the way he he defined modern religion. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it was uh, it, very, very much there. It, it, the roots are are there in Islam. But but turning turning to another question here that that we wanted to ask about about, about the connection between Islam and and the Baha'i faith. Uh, sort of a twofold question. One is, what resources or advice do you recommend for people interested in looking at the connection between the two, and what areas in that connection are underexplored? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, in the Guardian, when it asked, asked by the friends in North America, well, what what about Islam? <laughs> he said. Of course, in some uh, some of these statements come via sort of uh, pilgrim's note type things, but some are also written by his own pen. So they all seem to harmonize. He says the responsibility of North America is to vindicate Islam, to vindicate Islam. And there's n there's no group category of human being on the face of other needs vindication more than Muslims. These days, I think we, as Baha'is, we can see this. You know, we we trace our lineage there, and the, there are, Islam is our parent. You know, we are we are sort of that, Islam is Jacob, and 
And, you know, if you like, uh, we're, we're the offspring. But, uh, uh, and he also said that in order to, because of the highly vexed, violent, vicious relationship between the Islamic world and the non-Western world over the past 14 centuries or whatever it was, is there are numerous cultural and intellectual obstacles to proceeding <laughs> with this. And he was pointing to this when he said, your, your task to do this will require a great deal of erudition. You see, this is, is one of his statements. But you sh he didn't say, therefore, you should give up. <laughs> he said, they, no, you should carry on because it, it, it's part of who we are as Baha'is. And to ignore it is to ignore the self. But more importantly, as lovers of humanity, we need to understand and deeply understand what the, the Muslim world, which how, how many billions of people is this now? What two and a half billion, something like that? Mo three, uh, I mean, it ain't going away. It's not, you know, Islam is here to stay, Christianity is here to stay. The Baha'i faith offers a method of harmonious living together. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, yeah, the Baha'i faith also says in one place that, uh, you know, the, the, the Baha'i teachings do not abrogate any existing. And, and then in another place it says it has abrogated. It's hard to reconcile these, these apparent contradictions. But I'm for the non-abrogation side of things. And I, I see the human beings love their religions, their grandma was a Muslim, they're never going to change because they love their grandma, you know. Uh, this is the way the world works. Human beings, it's not mysterious. But to understand Islam, we need to, number one, get to know your Muslim neighbors. Discover how much you can learn <laughs> about how to be a Baha'i from associating with with your fellow Muslim citizens who who are very sophisticated spiritually and socially after after following it's in the DNA the Islamic Sharia which is not just a dirty word it also teaches people how to live together harmoniously and productively you know and you and the and if you've never met people from the Islamic faith, you are struck by their kindness, their hospitality, their patience, their 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 discretion, <laughs> their generosity. You know, these are things we need to learn. So we can, and that's learning about Islam. But also, there there are important books to read for for. English speaking Westerners about Islam. And the most important, I think, is Hodgson, The Venture of Islam. Uh, and it's unfortunately also one of the more gummy ones as far as literary style is concerned. So we need to have maybe some Ruhi books written about the Venture of Islam that can help translate some of his wonderful, beautiful. Uh, uh, inspiring insights into normal everyday speech that practicing human beings can relate to. Uh, that's a, it's called the Venture of Islam. It's a trilogy. Uh, the the Quran and when people ask which translation, all translations are equal in that they all fail, obviously. Uh, and so you know, uh, Robert Frost says poetry is that which is lost in translation, right? And, much more than mere poetry is lost in the translation of the Quran, but we need to take it seriously. We need to really understand what we owe to the Quran so we can understand what we don't owe to the Quran, if you like. You know, and uh, th these are, you know, and I mean, I, actually, I'm quite serious. There should be some 
Ruhi books about Islam and the Quran and Islam, these things. I mean, it is a, it's a, it's our closest relative. Hmm. And it, and if you look at again, back to Omid's question, what about the formative period uh, of, of Baha'i faith? It seems obvious from a strictly historical perspective that the Baha'i teachings, especially from Baha'u'llah and things like the Hidden Words, were uh, proclaimed in a spirit of uniting the Muslim community in Baghdad, which was half Shi'i and half Sunni. These, these hidden words are make no communalistic claims, very unusual for, for uh, things that were written in those days, and put us all together. Depending upon the deeply uh, embedded notion in Islam of the human being. This is one of the main themes of the Quran, by the way, the human being. Humanity, the human being. This, appear, this is a sacrament almost in the Quran that doesn't exist to the same extent in the, in the Hebrew Bible or the, or the New Testament or, in fact, in other religious, Islam has invented humanity in a sense. And that we, we are now dealing with the implications of this, this uh, invention. Uh, humanity which occurs... It's, humanity is the reality. It occurs as an individual or as a community or as a society, as, if you like, a particle or a wave. But it is a reality. It is a, at which Islam has much to say about, it, especially in the Quran. I think I got off topic. I'm sorry. Hmm? Not at all. Not at all. Before we turn to uh, questions that uh, we may have from uh, those listening on Facebook and on on YouTube, which I'll sort of let Rob, Rob uh, moderate. Um, I want to thank you, firstly, for your very insightful comments and remarks, and uh, offer you an opportunity here at the end to have some comments about prospects for the for the future. Uh, as someone who has contributed and enriched. Uh, our understanding of Islam and our understanding of the Babi and Baha'i religions, what some of your hopes are for the future of these fields as um, a spaces of academic inquiry? What are some of the uncharted lands, some of the frontiers that have not yet been ventured to, some of the areas or topics that you would like to see further exploration on in the future by, by students of, of both of these religious traditions? Okay, um, well, to continue to rethink and retranslate and reconsider the writings, of course, this is uh, something that, that should be ongoing. Uh, in no sense, obviously, to replace existing translations, but, but to go deeper than, than one might have. In other words, to take seriously the idea that, you know, they're in Arabic and Persian. And to and to try to come to terms with these things, I don't think it should be obligatory that Baha'is have to learn Arabic and Persian. But I, I I think that in general in the Baha'i community, the humanities needs to be a little bit more privileged, as a as something for the friends to engage in that is a profitable and important uh, pursuit. The study of history and poetry and literature, all of these things are necessary to uh, to help us understand our own writings and our own history and our own position in the world. Frequently, they're given short shrift and put under the category that Baha'u'llah uses things of studies that begin and end in words. And we don't think that this is exactly what he was talking about. The humanities, you know, uh, maybe don't pay a great deal, uh, but but, but nonetheless, they are, they are exceedingly important to keep things alive. To, to, so in general, the humanities. Uh, this, 
the study of of the prophet Muhammad, the study of of uh, Islam, of course, as I've been saying since we started talking here, it's been sort of a commercial for the study of Islam. But, but I'm quite serious about it. I think it's really, really essential for us to, to have a, a, a fuller picture of who we are. <laughs> and you see, Islam has been studied in the West for, a, for you know, a while, not, not as long as you might think. But, you know, one of the dire features of this monster called Orientalism is, um, is that, you know, studying Islam without really thinking you have anything to learn from it. <laughs> you see? Do you get me? You know, that, you know, yeah, we can study these texts and translate these texts and and uh, study history and, uh, you know, who won and so forth. But do we have anything to learn existentially from the experience of the Muslim community, which is quite heroic? <laughs> uh, you know, the life of the prophet and the imams and the great uh, Sufi sheikhs and the great scholars of Islam. Their their uh, their lives are full of lessons for humanity in general. So that's sort of where I'm stuck. I, that's 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 what I'm selling. <laughs> I think that's a good place to be stuck. And and we did indeed want this to be, you might say, a commercial on us on studying Islam, as you said, um, because uh, I, we completely agree with you that this is essential for Baha'is. To understand their own faith, and and for that matter, for all human beings to understand this incredible uh, eruption of truth and knowledge yes. uh, that occurred fourteen hundred plus years ago, and continues to develop. Actually, that's right. Very much, very much continues to develop. We do have a fair number of questions uh, on Facebook, and uh, I, I should say uh, Facebook and YouTube because they've all been coming through here in StreamYard, and it's that's quite a nice feature of, of StreamYard. Some of them, are, I think, are a little more useful than others, but I'll, I'll choose a few of them at least. Uh, one person says, does the seal of the prophets exclude the seal of the messengers? Seal of the messengers. Uh... You know, because there's the reference in the Quran to Muhammad being the seal of the prophets. Right. But there's the whole question: Was he also the seal of the messengers? I suppose. I guess that's what the person. I've said. never encountered that uh, locution before. The seal of the messengers, anywhere. Yeah. You Omid, have you seen that? Only seal in the Baha only in the Baha'i writings. Oh, oh okay. Uh, I mean, the I mean, one of the great things about Hudson is that uh, he he sort of very clear eyed looks at these things and says. You know, the, the Quran speaks about the seal of the prophets once. <laughs> mm -hmm. Once. And um, <clears throat> Hazza is very clear, very certain that there's nothing in the Quran that suggests that revelation will ever stop. That there will never be another divine messenger. He says that there's no, the Quran does not have this idea at all. Quite the contrary, he says. It's quite otherwise that, that, in fact, according to the Quran, God will carry on sending messengers. And that the reason that this 3340 was chosen and seized upon was, in fact, to protect the community from the rise of quite a few so-called false prophets at the time of the death of, the, uh, uh, of Muhammad. And the Omar and, and Abu Bakr, and the the uh, if you like leaders of the early Muslim community seized upon that verse <laughs> to say that you know, see here this is we in order to preserve our own unity and our own strength and our own vitality it has to be the case that these other prophets have to be rejected because it leads to obvious results so that's how it became prominent. And became a, again another a marker of Islamic identity. Shiism, of course, tried to circumvent 
this problem in the institution of the imamate. <clears throat> Sufism tried to circumvent the problem with the establishment of tariqas and and sheikhs and uh, uh, divine guidance in the institution which Baha'is esteem very highly known as walaya right the guardian is our representative of the institution of walaya the imams are the representatives of walaya for shiism <laughs> the sufi sheikhs and in the case of sufism Excuse me. But it's the same word. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very firm, robust continuity between Islamic categories and Baha'i categories. Walaya carries on and continues to flourish in the guardianship. It actually means guardianship. This is what it is. The, the guardian, Shoghi Effendi, was the wali, the of the Amr of God, the the Wali of uh, the cause of God. <clears throat> so these, despite the early petitioning of that problematic verse in the Quran, thirty three forty, life went on. Authority continued to be, and and even though it wasn't Nabuwa, it was. Yeah, it was Ilham and 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 Nabuwa, which amounts to the same thing. In fact, if you look at some of the <coughs> Quran commentaries that focus on the words of the Imam, it's clear that the words of the Imam become more important <laughs> than the words of the Quran. And this 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 gives the lie to the idea that revelation has stopped in in practice, in reality. Now, how did we get here, by the way? <laughs> it was from the West. So, I just want to just echo the, the, the comment that Dr. Lawson made that in, in nowhere in the Quran, this really can't be emphasized or appreciated enough, that nowhere in the Quran does the Quran disallow or uh, not foresee the possibility that divine revelation, that God's revelation will continue. And to... Uh, an earlier remark of Dr. Lawson, he invoked uh, a, a much loved verse in uh, the 18th surah of the Quran, which some have called the apocalypse of the Quran, where the Quran says, you know, if the sea were ink for the words of God, all the seas, all the oceans of the earth were ink for the words of God, the seas would themselves be exhausted before the words of God are exhausted. Even if another C were added to them. Even if another C were added to them. I mean, yeah. That's interesting. We do have a few other um, questions that I think we can... Th this one is, I think, in, in perhaps a little provocative in a way. Uh, when we speak about Islam, aren't there many versions of Islam? Isn't this seeming diversity actually creating clashes between Muslims as it did from the beginning? And given this fact, is not the Baha'i faith true Islam in our day? Uh, is this written down in the side panel somewhere? I can it's read it. under comments. If you click on the comments panel, yes. it's kind of far down because up at the top, there's various comments about people not being able to get onto YouTube. It's the comment that was made at 401. So read it again to me then. Uh, when we speak about Islam, aren't there many versions of Islam? Yeah. Isn't this seeming diversity actually creating clashes between Muslims as it did from the beginning? And given this fact, is not the Baha'i faith true Islam in our days? Well, it is It is certainly true that there are Muslims that uh, whose I, their communal identities are distinct from each other. There are many different communal identities. That is true, but difference doesn't automatically suggest conflict or violence. Sometimes it comes up. For example, in the history of Islam, there have been long periods of time where Shi'i and Sunni Muslims did not fight each other. <laughs> they, they got along perfectly. They even intermarried, did business with each other, mm -hmm. sold property to each other, and on and on and on. But, you know, when our friends, the politicians get involved, 
they tend to stimulate differences amongst people. We have it all over the place uh, today. It's sort of an enduring aspect of uh, the human political genius, I guess. So, so it is, yeah, there can be, one of the great teachings of the Quran and Islam is that there can be difference. There is difference for a sacramental reason. That is, to, so people will come to know, so people will participate in the process of knowing and getting to know each other. This is a Quranic verse. It is. So, so the, the idea of getting to know each other is, is tremendously important. We need to accent the positive, friends. <laughs> <laughs> we had there are enough people in the world that go the other way. Yep. At least we can keep the bright thought. Yep. And and the the Shiites and the Sunnis in the United States and I'm sure in Canada get along pretty well. That's right. You know, here in the South Bend area, the Sunnis had no mosque for many many years. They went to Michigan City to the Shiite mosque. You know. Right. Yeah. It's, just, it's time and place and political agendas. Yep. Yep. And if you recall, this is where the, the beauty of the Day of the Covenant comes in, because the, the Day of Alast is this unique image offered by the Quran to the entire world that <clears throat> at a time before creation, before time and place existed, all every human being who would ever be born and created was gathered in this mysterious place all together, gazillions mm -hmm. of human beings in perfect harmony and love. The idea is to return to that state. Yeah. This is a Quranic image. I haven't seen it in any other uh, scripture. Yeah. And of course, Baha'u'llah loves this image and it's throughout the Baha'i writings in various places. But this comes from the Quran. Uh, Surah 7, verse 172, friends. <laughs> One person asks about a good the, the good Quran translations. <laughs> and translations. So you go to a website called Islam Awakened, and there you have about 35 translations for each verse. Wow. And you read them all. <laughs> Good uh, but I mean, if in, if you're short on time, you can also. Uh, uh, I mean, I happen to like a couple, but these are personal preferences. Uh, but all of them have problems. <laughs> you know, all of them have problems. So, the study Quran, the new one, is pretty good. I mean, it's very useful. It has commentary. The one by Yusuf Ali is a, is a, is a very beautiful one. Uh, it, it's difficult. We need to... The Islam Awakened is very useful because you can, you can have ranged before you a fairly accurate list of what the possibilities for the translation of the verse are. And then you'll see things like, I mean, the, the translation by Arthur Arbery is very eloquent and very beautiful. I think the Guardian might have, uh, if he'd known about it before he uh, died, might have mentioned it. Uh, he liked the Rodwell translation, which was scientifically rearranged in the order of, of uh, uh, revelation. But uh, I would I would say uh, Abdul Halim is pretty good, you know. Uh, uh, there there are a few that are good, but you should really now that we have the internet, it's like it was made for the study of Islam, you know. The internet or or the study of the Quran, especially, you can go there to this site Islam Awaken, which I think Omid turned me on to a long time ago. It's very very useful. We've got uh, every possible translation that exists in English these days right there so you can compare them and make your own decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> may, I, may I take this opportunity, in other words, sort of in a public space, uh -huh. to, um, to humbly but very seriously offer the suggestion to you to consider 
translating the Quran into English. Oh dear. Well, you can, you can certainly suggest it, yes. Yes, well, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, beyond, it's beyond me. I couldn't do this. Hmm? But, uh, and I'm not... Maybe for, I, maybe for that reason that you feel that it's beyond you, you're perhaps the most appropriate person to take well, this Well, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's thank you for the vote of confidence. But it's, uh, I mean, in a sense... It seems like what we really don't need is yet another translation. What we mm -hmm. need is to take the ones we have seriously. <laughs> sit down with them because, you know, it's like, you know, you Xerox something, oh, I've got that, you know, and you never look at it again. Oh, I've got that Quran on my shelf. You don't open it. You need to open it and look at it. What One good thing for Baha'is to do would be to find all the Quranic quotations in the writings and line them up and read them and then go to islam awakened or something like that and see how what the various the differences are you'll find i uh, i predict that you will be very impressed with the with the level of uh, uh ability in the translations that we have in in the baha'i writings many of them by the guardian uh the guardian's translations are incredible <laughs> <laughs> Truly, yeah. So that would be a place to go. Yeah. That that inspires the idea, though. Maybe until the you, you consider the possibility of actually getting in contact with this website, Islam Awakened, and yeah. providing the translations of Shohi Effendi and translations of Quranic verses that have been authorized by the Universal House of Justice, because the website is uh, you know indiscriminate. The, the person behind the website provides yeah. translations from Muslims and non-Muslims and yeah. He tends to label, designate things uh, in a rather odd way, but nonetheless, he's open to including any and all translations. Well, you know, that's great. That's a great idea. I think that what would be a very good thing in order to uh, <laughs> make this a more re realistic is for the high communities to appoint someone to be the Islam person in their community, yeah. the person who looks after, and to at the Association for Baha'i Studies and other such gatherings have special sessions for these people to get together and talk about Islam, and to and to come up with this idea that you just had. I'm certainly not going to do this. I don't have time to do it, you know. But but somebody starting out, you know, with a lot of energy and and computer savvy and so forth, these things could happen. But, the, you know, the community really needs to understand that we have to do, We have, how can we vindicate Islam when half the time we avoid anything to do with it? Mm -hmm. Half the time, 90% mm -hmm. of the time. We, yeah. can, we confuse Islam with the actions of people who uh, esteem themselves Muslims who if, 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 if the prophet saw them would weep tears of blood. That's the problem. Yeah. Islam is not the problem. It's people who misrepresent Islam. And that's why we have to vindicate it in the West. Right. Because we're the ones who are being suffering from the, many of those extremist Muslims in Iran. You know, we're we're the ones who have yeah. to say, in spite of that, yeah, we and, and 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 in the process, the Baha'i faith becomes misunderstood as a kind of strange anti-Islamic movement. Yeah, it really needs attention, <laughs> friends. Yeah, yeah. No, nothing could be more of a distortion of the Baha'i faith. Yeah. We don't have many minutes left since we're getting close to 90 minutes here, but uh, there are a couple of other comments. One person says, thank you so much uh, for saying, uh, you know, uh, what you've said about uh, what we can learn from our Muslim brothers and sisters. She's a Baha'i who has an amazing Shiite advisor at the Graduate Theological Union of Berkeley, California. All right. Who has really helped her to learn about the Baha'i faith while she's also been learning about Islam. And that that is very true from what I've seen in that particular case as well. Beautiful. Another person farther down here says, um, 
Uh, let's see. One person comments, some, something that I mentioned to Baha'is when we study the Baha'i text is that without a grasp of biblical and Quranic imagery, symbols and metaphors, we miss a great deal of what Baha'u'llah and the Bab mean when they talk about Joseph, when they talk about the snow white hand of God, which is a refer reference to something from the story in, in Exodus. Uh, many, your many talks on the imagery of Joseph has been essential for, for Baha'is to study uh, these topics. Uh, and then another person asks this question, is the diversity of translations and commentaries of the Quran causing confusion in the Muslim community? Uh, I don't know. Um, Possibly. Maybe. Confusion is not a bad thing. You can't be <laughs> unconfused unless you were confused first. <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a sort of a learning nexus. Uh, but I don't. I, can that person explain this a little more somehow? Oh, maybe maybe they'll they'll make a comment uh, about it. Um, let's see. I don't see any of the other any other comments in here right offhand that are. Can you read that again, real quick, uh, Rob? Yeah. The isn't the diversity of translations and commentaries creating confusion in the Muslim community? No. I mean, there is maybe confusion, but it's not created by this. No, I don't. I don't think so, uh, because the, the long history of Quran commentary already has preserved many disagreements about yeah. the meaning of the Quran over time. This is one of the things you discover uh, when you start studying uh, the, the Quran that there have been many, uh, sometimes conflicting, uh, understandings of verses. But uh, this didn't always lead to people fighting to the death. Yeah. The people, you know, you, the, we were fond of this Persian saying, that, that kasrat, you know, that there is unity and multiplicity or unity and difference. This comes from Islam and the Baha'is have inherited. You know, there is, the idea of unity, this idea of tawhid is not. Tawhid means to be able to see the unity in the world. Right. It doesn't mean unity. Yeah. Unity is wahda. Tawhid is adopting consciously the perspective of the interconnectedness of all things. Yeah. Very well, good. Well, well, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's pretty much all of the significant questions that we've received today. I don't know, Todd, do you, I mean, Omi, do you have any comments you want to make here before we actually close? Just appreciation and gratitude to Dr. Lawson for uh, his time, his attention. Can, uh, his Omid, can, sorry to interrupt you. I just saw a very important question here down at the bottom, and I think it kind of helps answer one of the questions you asked earlier. Can I have two seconds to answer sure. this? Sure. Very sorry. So here's a question. Isn't the Muslim community required to learn the Quran in Arabic? Hmm. And classically, traditionally, it has been the idea that the Quran only functions in Arabic. It's only holy in Arabic. This is a huge difference in the Baha'i uh, faith. Baha'u'llah has never, ever mm. made such a suggestion. In fact, he, from the very beginning, wanted to have things translated, and there's never been the slightest hint. That, despite what people might have <laughs> gotten the impression of hearing me go on and on about things, Baha'u'llah has never suggested that Arabic is necessary for faith or Persian is necessary for faith. You can read the Baha'i writings in any language as long as the translation is accurate. It is, if you like, liturgically uh, uh, good. So, the, the, And I think in the Muslim world today, things might be changing a little bit. But there's a great hesitancy to uh, dislodge the sacredness of the Arabic language because it is so special. And when you all of you out there start studying Arabic next week, you will begin to understand how special Arabic is. It is a, it is it's really incredible. Uh, so there, that's a kind of a difference between the Baha'i position and the 
classical or traditional Islamic one. Very sorry, Omid. No, I'm so glad you 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 uh, offered that and shared that. Thank you so much. Just in parting, I wanted to encourage uh, all of our uh, listeners, viewers, now and in the future, who wish to uh, read some of Professor Lawson's published works or to contact him directly, you may do so by visiting his website, which is uh, very simple, Todd, T-O-D-D, Lawson, dot C-A. Uh, so we encourage you, uh, please, to visit the website. And he's placed scans of some of his articles. We hope more of his published works will be added there and uh, accessible and available. And uh, Rob, back to you. To yeah, some, and, and to remind everybody that the Corinne True Center has a website as well at corinthruecenter.org. Remember, Corinne has got uh, one R and two N's, not two R's and one N. So it's C-O-R-I-N-N-E-T-R-U-E -E Center, all one word, dot org. And you will, if you go there, also find information about our upcoming uh, webinar. Our next one is in early May, uh, sorry, yes, early May with uh, Michael McMullen, a sociologist who's a Baha'i down in Texas, talking about the Baha'i response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and comparing it to the responses of other denominations in the United States using um, extensive surveys that were done by the on the Baha'i community and other, other uh, communities as well. So it should be quite an interesting presentation. And then after that, we will have on the 19th of May, uh, Adib, uh, Masumi, I'm talking about his translation of the second volume of Mahmoud's diary right. uh, into English. That that volume covers Abu Baha's trip to Europe, and that's a particularly interesting one. I'm particularly interested in seeing and asking him about the reference Abu Baha makes there about the importance of space travel in the future, which apparently Abu Baha said uh, in Paris. Uh, hmm. So that pretty much wraps up our uh, discussion today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us here at the Korean True Center for the study of Baha'i history. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Mm -hmm. Thank you again and goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.